This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This is TWIV, This Week in Virology, a special episode recorded on September 17th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Today we are recording at the annual meeting of the European Society for Clinical Virology. It's all online this year. Sadly, we don't get to go to Europe. I was at this meeting in 2019 in Copenhagen, where I also did a TWIV. And today we have two sessions of TWIV. Uh, We have a first one following right now, and then we have a, a half hour break or so, and then a second session. And I have a number of participants at this meeting, and we're going to talk uh, all about COVID-19 and the pandemic. And to start off this first session, my two guests are from the University of Oxford, Sarah Gilbert. Welcome to TWIV. Thank you. It's great to be here. And from Mount Sinai School of Medicine, not too far from me here in New York City, Florian Kramer. Welcome back, Florian. Hello, Vincent. Thanks for the invitation. Florian was last on TWIV in uh, the summer, I think 2019, at a influenza virus meeting in Baltimore. And um, we had intended to get you back and talk about influenza, but something else happened <laughs> to, yes. to interfere with that. So here we are. But we, we uh, I have a feeling we're going to see some influenza this winter. So we'll probably have you back to talk about it. Uh, so so uh, Sarah Gilbert has to leave uh, in 30 minutes or so. I'm, I'm very grateful that you came at all. I, I appreciate it. Uh, I've wanted to talk to you for uh, for a long time. So let's start with you. Uh, and, um, I wanted to ask you, um, I want to talk about your adenovirus vector Chadox one and its use for uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. But I wonder if you could tell us a little bit of the history of the vector. When did you start working on it and uh, what else has it been used for? Well, we started on, on this particular vector in about 2010. Uh, and prior to that, I'd worked on other, uh, means of inducing T cells by vaccination, particularly that would be suitable for use in humans. And this originally came out of work on malaria vaccine development with Adrian Hill, who's the head of the group, um, wanting to be able to induce T cell responses against malaria, specifically against antigens that are expressed in the liver stage. And that's the very first stage. This isn't virology, sorry, this is parasitology, but it is very <laughs> similar. Um, that's the first um, stage of the parasites. They go into the body from the bite of an infected mosquito within minutes and in less than an hour, they get inside liver cells and there they start multiplying. And because they're inside cells, antibodies can't get at them and they, they can't do anything mm-hmm. to them. Um, they don't spend very long in the blood and then they're hidden. But T cells that can recognize um, infected liver cells can destroy those infected liver cells. And if you can make that happen efficiently, which you can do in animal models, um, then you can stop the infection progressing. People don't know they've been infected. They, they're not symptomatic. They don't transmit the infection to anybody else. So that was the original idea. How can we do T cells with vaccination in humans? Started looking at lots of different ways of doing that. DNA vaccines, um, proteins with adjuvant, peptides with adjuvant, viral vector vaccines, always replication deficient viral vector vaccines because they're much safer to use. They don't spread in the body after infection. So even in people with a compromised immune system, uh, they're safe to use. And we looked at um, modified vaccinia viruses, which don't replicate. So relatives of the smallpox vaccine, but a safer version of the smallpox vaccine. And in the lab, we were using human adenoviruses and, and they're great at inducing T cell responses and antibody responses. But the version we were lo- using in the lab was um, a really common human serotype. It's called AD5. A clue is in the is in the number. So the lower numbers were identified first. Um, so they're the ones that are more common. And so the higher number it is, the rarer it is because it took longer to get identified. So AD5 is pretty common. Lots of people have got neutralizing antibodies against adenovirus 5. So it's a great vaccine for any animal that you care, any mammal you care to try it in. And we've tried lots. But in humans, you've got this problem that some people already have immunity to the vector. So there were various ways of getting around that using a rarer human serotype is one giving a really high dose of the vaccine is another. Both of those approaches have been used in COVID. Uh, We took the approach of using an adenovirus that doesn't normally circulate in humans. It circulates in chimpanzees. 
So its genetic structure is almost identical to that of a human adenovirus. It's just separated geographically. It's separated by the population that it circulates in. And there's not very much crossover of viruses in general between chimpanzees and humans. It's not that they can't ever happen, but it doesn't happen very often. So people don't already have antibodies against the, the simian adenovirus or the CHAD that we called it. And we converted that into a vaccine vector started doing clinical trials with a flu antigen in it for about in about 2012 following then we do, we've done 12 clinical trials by the end of 2019 with chalux one vectored vaccines concentrating on outbreak pathogens so viruses that we already knew about that have caused outbreaks that we don't have vaccines against and that includes um Lassa virus nipah virus um chikungunya zika um, but also, um, importantly, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS, mm. which is a coronavirus. So we'd already made a vaccine against a coronavirus. We tested it in two clinical trials in the UK and in Saudi Arabia. We knew how to manufacture it. This is the beauty of vaccine platform technologies. You do so much work on the technology itself, you can then just adapt it to whichever vaccine you want to make next. You already know how to manufacture it, what dose you want to use in your clinical trials, what the likely um, reactogenicity is of the vaccine of that particular dose and how likely you are to induce both T-cell and antibody responses. But it was even better, the fact that we'd already had a coronavirus vaccine in the clinic and seen that we could induce a T-cell response and we could induce binding antibodies and neutralizing antibodies against MERS coronavirus in that clinical trial in people both in the UK and in Saudi Arabia where the MERS virus is most common. So that meant that we were really well placed um, when we heard about SARS-CoV-2 before it was even called SARS-CoV-2. So these the trials that you mentioned, these were mainly phase one and two trials, I presume? Yeah, many phase one trials just looking at um, immune responses in healthy adults, mm. mostly 18 to 55 years old. Uh, but some of them, for the flu vaccine trials, we tested it in older subjects as well. So we already knew we got a good response in older people with an adenovirus vector vaccine. Although those in those trials, those were healthy older people, mm. not necessarily representative of the general population. That's something that comes a bit later on in clinical development, and we haven't looked at that at that point. Is it, is it uh, likely that any of those will eventually be used? Well, we're trying to get back to the um, emerging pathogen vaccine development now, because all of that was on hold during the pandemic. Yeah. Um, some of those, like Nipah virus, for example, which is one that I'm trying to move forward with, that will probably be licensed for emergency use and held as a stockpile in, in the relevant areas. So most cases of Nipah virus uh, occur in humans in Bangladesh. It has happened in India, in Singapore, in Malaysia. So it would make sense to have a vaccine that's been tested, is approved for emergency use and to have a stockpile. So if you start to see cases happening, you're ready to contain that outbreak as quickly as possible. Other ones, such as um, Rift Valley fever virus, may actually be used as a livestock vaccine more widely than as a human vaccine. So that's a virus. It's really interesting, I think, that it can stay in the eggs of um, infected mosquitoes. And it's not fussy about which insect species it infects. It infects as about 12 different species. And the eggs can be infected and stay in the ground um, for up to 10 years in dry conditions. And then when rains come, those eggs hatch, um, grass grows, animals come, start feeding on the grass, they get bitten by the insects, they get Rift Valley fever virus. And it's really difficult to control because there might not have been any virus in that area for the previous 10 years. And suddenly it appears it infects sheep, cattle, goats, camels. Camels travel a long way, they spread the outbreak to other parts of the country. So vaccinating livestock um, is really important. Now it doesn't really cause a very severe disease in livestock. It does cause sheep to lose their lambs. So it, severe economic losses for the farmers, and it's quite severe in, in young lambs if they get infected. But if humans get infected from the livestock, they get a really serious hemorrhagic disease. It's not unlike Ebola um, and can have a very high fatality rate and can have long lasting effects even in people who recover. So there, the strategy probably needs to be to vaccinate livestock and control the disease because then humans don't get infected. But again, it's worth having a stockpile of the vaccine tested in humans, ready to use in humans. So when an outbreak happens, as it does from time to time, 
there's a vaccine to protect the healthcare mm. workers who go and respond to the outbreak, but also to protect the people who are um, being infected in the outbreak and, and shut it down as quickly as possible. I, I suppose that would be the approach for the MERS coronavirus vaccine to, to immunize camels, right? Yeah, we've done some immunization of camels. I don't think we got the dose quite right. <laughs> we gave them a human dose and they probably need more. So we need to go mm. back. But that it, that's difficult to, to get anybody interested in because MERS really doesn't cause disease in camels. Mm. They get a slight cold. They get a slightly runny nose and then they recover. <laughs> and then it's like, it's like human kids with seasonal coronavirus infections. Young mm. kids don't really get seriously ill. They just get a snotty nose and they spread it around to their friends. Uh, and then we get infected again a bit later on in life. But we, with coronavirus infections in general, um, we build up immunity throughout life because we've been infected to the four different human coronaviruses multiple times. And it's only a problem in older people uh, uh, wh whose immune systems are not working so well. It's the same in camels with MERS virus. They don't get ill, but they do get reinfected throughout life. The youngest camels seem to have the highest viral loads and they, they just infect all the other young camels. And then older camels can get reinfected. But it means that um, there's no economic reason for vaccinating the camels because yeah. it doesn't cause them any illness. So you have to have a, a public health campaign to vaccinate the camels um, to protect people and stop them getting infected. That would be a good way to do to do to, do, to control MERS infections. But, it, you know, it's quite a lot to organize. So we call it one health approach, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's true of many of these outbreak pathogens too. You know, some of them come straight from bats to humans, but a lot of them infect livestock and that's where we get exposed and, and then we get infected. Yeah. Now, when in the in the beginning of the COVID pandemic, did you think, let's put the spike into our vector? Probably in the first days of January, 2020. Mm -hmm. um, I, I saw... Um, news of an outbreak happening um, in China. And at that mm. point, it wasn't known what type of virus, it, or even if it was a viral infection. And that gradually the story built, uh, you know, we began to see that it, it was a virus, but it wasn't flu, it wasn't adenovirus. It's a coronavirus. We need to make a vaccine. We, we know exactly what to do because we've done it before. So um, as soon as the sequence was released, mm. we got started, um, chose exactly the sequence we wanted to put into our adenoviral vector um, and started making it. But the difference was that we went really, really fast. So I've been through the process of taking vaccines from concept through to phase two trials before. It generally takes years because mm -hmm. we have to do a small amount. Then we have to stop, present the data, ask for some money. Could we do a non-human primate study, please? Um, then we present the data. Could we manufacture for a clinical trial? Could we have the money to do the clinical trial? And it, it's not the work that we need to do that, that, that takes the time. It's It's the writing it up and asking for money to move to the next stage. And that didn't happen in 2020. We just, we, we'd already knew what to do and we knew what piece of information we needed to trigger the next stage. So we just did everything as fast as we could. So when you first decided to start, did you, did you think it would work, work in quotes? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did because um, we'd already seen really good results from the MERS clinical trial. Uh -huh. So we'd seen everybody we immunized developing um, binding antibodies, neutralizing antibodies, T cell response, um, even from a single, just from a single dose. Um, uh -huh. Why, you know, very good reason to believe that that would be protective in humans. We'd done a challenge study in non-human primates with the MERS vaccines, good protection there against a very high dose challenge. Um, so, yeah, we really felt that it, it had a strong chance of working. Of course, it works better against the original um, virus, the Victoria strain, than it does against Delta because Delta is so much more transmissible. But we're still seeing um, good vaccine effectiveness against Delta variant. So, what this is a two dose vaccine, correct? Yeah. What, why did you decide on two doses? So, that was in the plan from the beginning of the clinical trials. We had a small mm -hmm. two dose group. We know that one dose gives us a good immune response, but we don't know what the correlates of protection are for coronavirus because we don't have. 
um, a vaccine used against any of the other human coronaviruses, either the seasonal ones or MERS or the original SARS. So we didn't really know how strong an immune response we had to aim for. But good grounds for believing if we gave two doses, we get a stronger response. Uh, and we wanted to test that. And we saw that in terms of antibodies and neutralizing antibodies with a four week interval between the doses, we certainly mm. did get a stronger response. So then that got written into the all the subsequent plans. We'll do two doses. But we also had different intervals between the doses. And we've now got a lot of data showing that the longer interval between the two doses really increases the immune response. Um, good, good vaccine efficacy um, from one dose. That was 70% after one dose, maintained to at least 12 weeks. And in the UK, the policy was then to give the second dose at 12 weeks. And that um, increases the, the antibody titers and um, they they are then being pretty well maintained in, in most people. I presume if the longer you wait, you get maturation and fitting maturation and, and getting broader reactive antibodies as well, right? Yeah, we haven't in detail studied the uh, difference in breadth uh, mm -hmm. of different time points. We yeah, we've, we've been concentrating on uh, looking at uh, breadth after a third dose. So we've done that mm -hmm. now. And um, we also have other work now in a clinical trial with um, a, a beta variant of the spike mm -hmm. to see what that does. And in preclinical studies, that giving two doses of the original vaccine and one dose of the beta variant really broadens the response and you get great responses against all the variants, not just beta, but gamma and delta as well, mm. and the original. So, so currently, as it's used, what is the spacing between dose one and two? Well, the original recommendation was 12 weeks. And then right. in the UK, when Delta variant was really circulating at the beginning of the summer, it was reduced to eight weeks, trying to find kind of optimum spot between getting strong immune responses, but not having to wait too long for it because Delta was taking over. So the, um, as you know, the if you recover from COVID and get one dose of a variety of vaccines, you have a really broad high affinity, very broad response, antibody response that can neutralize all the variants, even MERS and COVID-1. Is this, this th does this happen after three doses of uh, your adeno vaccine? We certainly get a very good uh, broad response against all the SARS-CoV-2 variants. We haven't looked at, against MERS and uh, the original SARS. Yeah. So do you, do, uh, do you recommend that people who have been infected get vaccinated still because here in oh, the US definitely. we do yeah yeah I think people who get infected should get vaccinated it will strengthen their immune response it will make it longer lasting and more protective now as, as a vaccinologist you know that when, when you immunize someone antibody serum antibody goes down with time right that's normal um, and so we saw that happening with many uh, of the COVID vaccines um, but Memory should still be there, right? So do you look at memory B cells at all or memory T cells even? We do. And yeah, and they're both induced really well. Mm -hmm. um, looking at the vaccine effectiveness data is quite a complex picture at the moment if you're trying to look at waning of immunity. Mm -hmm. So there's a study come from Israel uh, where they have been giving a third dose, but they gave, this was with the Pfizer, it wasn't with our vaccine, it was the Pfizer mRNA vaccine, but they gave all the primary series three weeks apart. Whereas in the UK, we switched to giving the Pfizer vaccine 12 weeks apart as well. And then that brought down to eight weeks and that gave higher antibody titers. So, yes, the antibody responses will wane, but they're starting from a higher level if you gave a longer mm -hmm. interval between the doses. Uh, and there's also the um, Delta variant to take into account. So when we're seeing waning immunity, how much is of that is because it's a slightly different virus that's circulating. Uh, and I believe... From the Israeli data, you can disentangle it, and giving a third dose does then increase effectiveness again slightly, but the vaccination schedule was different. And depending on which age group you look at, uh, in the UK, we've seen slightly more waning of immunity in older age groups than in younger. So it's a, it's a complex picture, and deciding on booster doses mm. is therefore um, difficult to do. Actually, today, the FDA is supposedly deciding in the U.S., uh, right, Florian? <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm not sure what the outcome will be. Maybe they'll, you know, there's a lot of discussion here about it. Uh, some people feel it's not indicated by the science and some people want to anticipate. Um, as you know, um, the vaccines still protect well against severe disease. They may still allow uh, moderate 
but severe in hospitalization and death. Is that the same with uh, with your vaccine? Yes. Yeah, definitely still getting good protection against hospitalization, severe disease and death, but um, not so much protection. So originally um, with the first virus that was circulating, we were seeing about 50 percent protection against asymptomatic infection, Mm -hmm. which was great. We're not really seeing that now, but um, we we are seeing more symptomatic infections, but not severe infections. Do you think the increased symptomatic infections is is a consequence of evasion by by variants such as Delta? I don't think it's a consequence of evasion. I think it's a consequence of the increased transmissibility and the higher viral load of Delta. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because Delta isn't really antigenically very different. Beta is much more different, but then it doesn't have the increased transmissibility. All right. So so because some have thought that, you know, when you take convalescent sera, you do nucleization assays, it's reduced, what, eightfold or so, depending on what... Yeah, it it is reduced, but we still see good vaccine effectiveness. But of course... As we'll talk about with Florian in a bit, we don't even know what eightfold reduction means in, in some ways. Now, some have suggested that because the vaccines still prevent you know, severe disease and death, that's a T-cell effect. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? I think T-cells are, are an important contributor. Mm-hmm. I think you know, the primary correlate protection is always going to be neutralizing antibodies. And they do cross-react to some extent, even though they, you know, it's not all or nothing. Um, we see drops in um, cross-reactivity of the neutralizing antibodies, but not complete loss. Um, but yeah, T cells are, you don't see any drop off in T cell reactivity uh, against the variants because it's only a few amino acids different. So you wouldn't expect to see any changes. And they are important for protection as well, but with the neutralizing antibodies. I don't think a, a, an approach of vaccinating just to induce T cells would be protective against this kind of virus. So this is actually a question that we've discussed. If you had only T cell immunity induced by this vaccine and no neutralizing antibodies. What what do you think would be the outcome when people got infected? Well, I think if you had a low infectious dose, yeah. you would have um, an infection uh, which the T cells could then control, but the T cells need to be in the respiratory tract. Right. Um, if you had a high infectious dose, then, then it's probably going to overwhelm the T cell response um, and you wouldn't get good protection. Okay. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Now, um, what's the story with the future? Uh, do you think we're going to have to change our vaccines? You plan to do that with yours, to, to like sort of like what we do with influenza vaccines, or is this one going to suffice? Well, what we've been doing um, for quite a long, well, since December of last year, actually, was setting up a pipeline so that we have everything in place, ready to make a new version with a with a variant spike in. If mm-hmm. somebody's worried about a new 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 variant, we have everything to go um, because in the initial manufacturing, it was all done in Oxford, um, and we then we passed over a master virus seed stock to other um, manufacturers, including AstraZeneca, who now have it in twenty five different manufacturing sites around the world, which is I think phenomenal. Um, and that's not about sharing IP rights. That's about actually doing proper technology transfer to make sure that other people can make the vaccine. But then we had to switch to um, making sure we had a, a plan for getting large scale manufacturing of, of new variants should we need them. So that mm-hmm. plan's there. We can do it. We have a clinical trial going on at the moment with the beta variant spike in the vaccine. And as I said, in the preclinical studies, we see that that gives a really broad um, antibody response against all the current variants, not just beta. It's it's really good against Delta as well and the original virus. So that trial's running. We're accumulating the data. We'll review and see, do we need it? Now, when we started that trial, people were really worried about the beta variant, but mm. that's been superseded by Delta now. Right. And Delta isn't antigenically particularly different from the original virus. So it's not the current plan that we're, we're going to switch to this variant version. Um, we will keep making new variants, assessing them preclinically, maybe some of them clinically, but it actually makes much more sense to be able to have a coordinated global vaccine strategy to stick with the same vaccine unless there's really good reason not to. What would be the indicators that would lead us to change the antigen in the vaccine? If we saw reduced vaccine effectiveness. And that's being monitored continually in many countries, but we get really good data coming through every month from the UK on vaccine effectiveness and on the sequencing. And we know which viruses are circulating, Mm -hmm. um, vaccine breakthroughs. So if vaccine effectiveness was to drop, 
Um, and that will mm -hmm. probably go along with um, a, a more pronounced drop in um, cross-reactivity of the neutralizing antibodies. That will be the time to consider mm -hmm. a switch. So we're, we're prepared to do a switch if we have to. As yet, we haven't seen evidence that we have to. So effectiveness would mean against all COVID or, or more serious? Yeah. yeah, all COVID, right? Yeah. So right now, looking at all the monitoring that you're doing, what what is the vaccine effectiveness against all COVID? I'm sure it varies according to the country, right? It, I don't have those figures at my fingertips. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not generated by our team. It's generated by pu the public health, public health England. So we generate efficacy data in the clinical trials. They sure, now sure, monitor sure. effectiveness. Um, I'm sorry, I can't remember the numbers and I don't want to tell you the okay. wrong ones. Okay. So what can you tell us what countries are, are using um, Chadox one based vaccine? Well, there's 180 of them. 180 countries. Yeah. And how many, how many millions of doses? 1.1 billion so far. Wow. And capacity increasing each month. Serum Institute are the biggest manufacturer. It mm -hmm. was um, out licensed to Serum Institute again with all the technology transfer. But it's really important that when other manufacturers make the vaccine, it's the same vaccine. And that only applies if, if all the technology transfer is done, all of the testing is the same. Um, and also you get much better yields when you teach people how to make a vaccine and then you make the best use of your raw materials. So, so far, 1.1 billion doses, aiming maybe for 2 billion by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Wow. That, is that the most of all of them? Or is, or is... It, I think it's about equal with Pfizer, rough, roughly, huh. the roughly equivalent. So had you any clue when this started that you would be able to, not you, but so much vaccine would be able to be manufactured in such a short time? No, this, I mean, the first time we heard anybody talking about billion doses, we were really taking a back because, you know, we we tend to manufacture 500 doses at a time. That's the, <laughs> that's what our little manufacturing facility does. And, um, you know, we were thinking, oh, we need to get into the millions. And then AstraZeneca came on board and they immediately start talking about billions. And Okay, <laughs> how are wow. we going to do that? But how are we going to do that is have 25 different manufacturing sites around the world. Um, Mm -hmm. The plan is manufacturing for local supply. Remember, it's a vaccine that doesn't need um, ultra-low temperature storage. It can be stored in a fridge, so it feeds into existing vaccine distribution networks, which is going to be really important for getting it out across Africa. But we need more of that to be going through COVAX into Africa because we've still only got about 2% of Africa fully vaccinated, and that's not near enough. Yeah, it's important to remember, remind everyone that there's a great, good part of the world that has virtually no vaccine and we have to help them, right? Yeah. We have to do that. They can't do it themselves. Uh, so could you further increase uh, manufacturing? You said you had 25 manufacturing sites. Can you do more? I think probably for now, 25 is, is going to be enough because the mm -hmm. amount each site produces each month is also increasing. Yield increases over time as, as the sites get more experienced. So, um, I think that's probably not going to expand. But for the longer term, I'm really interested in supporting the establishment of vaccine manufacturing sites in Africa, because one of the big problems, why one of the reasons Africa doesn't have any vaccine is because it doesn't manufacture any vaccine. And we need to try and fix that problem for the future. Right. So um, many have said the vaccination will end this pandemic. What, what, are you, what are your thoughts? When can we achieve enough global vaccination to do that? Well, I think it's probably going to take most of next year to do that because, um, you know, we need to get the doses out. The next problem that I think we're going to see is when um, more vaccine is available, we need to make sure that that vaccine can actually be distributed all the way to the vaccine clinics, not just to the airports in the countries. So that's, you know, that's the next thing to, to make sure can happen. And then we have to counter vaccine hesitancy in all mm. of these countries, because what we don't want is you know, misinformation coming from countries that have high rates of vaccination coverage, but also some anti-vaxxers. We don't want vaccine refusals to prevent the use of the vaccine in other countries. Well, I want to thank you for your work. I think uh, it's been great. And I love that you've spent years preparing for it and you were ready and uh, you know, everyone who's received your vaccine, thanks you. I'm very sure. Um, thanks very much. And I want to thank you. I'll, I know you have a meeting now, so I'll let you go. I want to thank you for joining us, Sarah Gilbert, University of Oxford, and uh, we'll hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you.
All right. Florian, the person who I always mistakenly call Franz Klammer. And you don't mind that, right? <laughs> no, I don't mind that. <laughs> That's a good, he was a, you probably remember him, right? <laughs> yes. Um, you used to, you used to work on influenza virus, right? Yeah, has 20 work, years ago. <laughs> has, has that been completely interrupted by uh, the pandemic? No, it hasn't been completely interrupted. So, um, you know, for for a short period of time, one and a half months, um, Mount Sinai didn't allow us to do anything else than COVID. Ah. Um, and for that period of time, of course, it was interrupted. But um, for the remaining time, we kept working on influenza. Maybe not with the 150% effort that we usually put yeah. into it. Yeah. Um, but it's taking up speed again. But yeah, um, there were some delays with our projects, but uh, flu is still very much on our radar. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to ask you about flu later. So uh, we've talked a lot about your work and um, you've collaborated with many groups, I think, including the group at Rockefeller at some point. And uh, you've, you've done a lot of work on mainly antibody responses uh, to both infection and vaccination, correct? That's, That's correct. correct. Um, and I, I think it, so much of your work has been done using pseudotyped viruses, right? Um, not necessarily. I like to work with authentic viruses, okay. actually. I was going to say, because the pseudotype allows you to work under BSL-2, right? But um, so you, I think you've also validated everything in, uh, in, uh, with authentic virus. Do you, do you have a BSL-3 there at Mount Sinai to do that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. And I think at times that was booked 24-7. Um, but we still try to do most of our SARS-CoV-2 neutralization work in biosafety level 3 with authentic virus. So would you say that there's 100% correlation between what you find with a pseudovirus and, and authentic SARS-CoV-2 virus? Um, there is a very good correlation. Um, and uh, there's actually a group um, uh, that's uh, led by NIAID that looks into variants, right? And um, of course, one important part of, of um, evaluating variants is to look at drops in neutralization. Right. Um, and so there's a lot of different groups that have different assays and we compare assays, right? And what typically happens is that it doesn't really matter if you have a lentivirus uh, pseudotyped assay or uh, something that's based on VSV or an authentic um, virus assay, which, you know, you can set up in very different ways. Yeah. Um, what we typically find is that uh, if you rank variants, you look at drop in neutralization, the rank order is usually the same. Um, the fault reduction might differ. And that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. Some mm -hmm. S's are more sensitive than others. Uh, but in general, uh, there's good agreement. Are you surprised? Because the various particles are very different. And this, you know, the, the architecture, the other proteins that are present, which might interfere. Um, are you surprised that they're so, that they're so aligned? Not really. Um, of course, an authentic, well, again, it, it depends on how you set these things up. You could uh, set up an authentic virus um, neutralization assay and you just look at entry, right? So yeah. if you look at, at uh, basically focus forming units or something like that, it's mostly virus entry. Uh, you can set it up uh, to let it go for many days and look at uh effects on viral egress and so on and so forth too. And then you get a little bit different results. But a lot of these assays are basically viral entry inhibition assays. And that's mm. also what the pseudotype particles do um, or to measure, right? So I'm not too surprised that, that we see similar okay. results in correlation, but the absolute titers that you get in different assays are different. Okay. So let, let's uh, summarize some of the observations um, you've made. So first, I guess some of the first studies you did were on uh, infected people, because that's all we had. We didn't have vaccines at the beginning, right? So what can you say about antibody immunity after infection? Uh, you know, durability, quality of the antibodies, heterogeneity in the population. So what we saw was that uh, basically almost everybody who got infected induced an antibody response, even mild and asymptomatic cases. Um, there is a trend that you get higher antibody titers and more severe infection. And uh, 
actually, and that's interesting, older males had higher antibody titers. That's consistent with a, in a lot of studies. Hmm. Um, and uh, it's surprising that somebody who is a little bit older gets higher antibodies than somebody who is younger. Hmm. And that might have had to do with severity of infection, right? Um, but what you also see, what you also see is that there's a lot of heterogeneity. Um, so you know, some people get really high antibody titers, some people get really low antibody titers, and you don't always have an explanation for that, right? Mm. Um, mm. It's not just severity, although there is a trend. We saw, for example, in some kids really high antibody titers, um, and we followed those people over months and. Of course, there's now many studies out there that did that. Um, and you get an initial increase in antibodies, which, you know, makes sense. That's driven by a B cell population that's called plasma blasts. Uh, they die off. Uh, they are very short lived. Um, and that. Once they're, they're basically dead after approximately seven days, mm -hmm. um, their antibodies stick around because the, the half-life of the, of IgG is a little bit longer. It's 21 days, right? And then, um, after that initial boost of antibodies, the titers start, titers start to fall, uh, a little bit. And then another subset of P cells takes over. And those are long lived plasma cells that mm -hmm. reside in the bone marrow mostly, but also in, in some tissues. And then they contribute to a, a relatively stable antibody level in zero. Um, and that's basically what we saw. Um, it got a little bit difficult. We have longitudinal studies where we follow people who got infected in, in the mm -hmm. beginning of the pandemic. It got a little bit difficult to further follow these people because they now all get vaccinated, right? And that, sure. of course, uh, doesn't allow you to yeah. kind of follow yeah, what happens yeah. after natural infection. Yeah, I mean, that's a, the interesting question is how long would that last? But you, most of them get vaccinated. Although I suppose not all of them, but it's still a small number, right? So we still have a few individuals that we follow that did not get vaccinated. And, yeah. you know, they still have detectable antibody titers and it's now basically one and a half years, right? Okay. Um, so, and the, the zero reversion, meaning people who really lost uh, measurable antibodies, it okay. always depends on the S and the S sensitivity, is relatively sure. low. It's about 5% in our observation period. Hmm. So the... Um if you have zero detectable, it doesn't mean there's no memory cells there, right? It's just maybe you just can't detect it, right? Well, there's two, there's a few different things, right? Maybe your assay is not sensitive enough yeah. and you have antibody, but you just can't pick it up with that sensitivity. And then the memory uh, in terms of B cell is, is interesting, right? The memory B cells don't make any antibody. They don't yeah. secrete antibody. They just circulate in your body and uh, wait if, and, and see if they encounter the, the pathogen again. And then they become plasma blasts very quickly and make tons of antibody. So, um, just because the antibody levels go down doesn't mean that the memory goes down. So can you measure the memory B cells easily or is that a harder assay? Oh, that's, you can do it. Of course, uh, they, they circulate in, in the periphery. So you can just get blood and isolate BBMCs and, and, and basically count them. Um, but of course, that's much harder than just to get serum sure. to an ELISA, for example. Yeah. Now, what? how much time does it take so, so, so let's say we have a person who's recovered from infection and they have uh, memory cells. So we're months out. So the antibodies have declined. And I suppose the mucosal antibodies decline very quickly compared to the serum antibodies. Is that not, not necessarily? Yeah. Well, or do they correlate? <laughs> well, that's the difficult thing here. There's two types of antibodies that you find on mucosal surfaces. There are mm. some uh, antibodies that actually come from sera and end up on mucosal surfaces. Right, right. Um, that would be monomer uh, would be IgG and monomeric IgA. And then you have a, a more specialized uh, mucosal antibody and that's uh, secretory IgA or dimeric mm -hmm. IgA. Mm -hmm. And the first two, of course, correlate with what you have in serum, uh, but the last one doesn't. Um, and those things are harder to measure because the concentrations yeah. are low on the mucosal surfaces. And then um, it's also harder to, to kind of consistently measure because on one day, you know, if you do a nasal wash, you might get more protein, you might get less protein. So it's harder to follow. Um, sure. But th these antibodies can also be present for quite some time. 
All right. So my, my original question was going to be, if you have recovered and then you affect infected later, how long does it take for the memory B cells to, to become activated and start to produce antibody? Um, so typically they peak seven days after an exposure, but it can okay. happen faster. Um, it can be even four days after, uh, after an, a re-exposure to it, um, to a, a pathogen. So before four days, you don't see much, but around four days, you, you can actually already see that they're coming up and there might be antibody coming up. Okay. Um, and that's helpful. And, um, if you look at certain pathogens that have longer incubation times, like hepatitis B, mm -hmm. um, the memory B cells are actually a correlate of protection because mm -hmm. they have enough time to come up and produce a response and still prevent you from getting sick. Right. And for influenza, for example, because the virus is so fast, um, they might prevent you from getting severe disease, but not from getting sick. Now, SARS coronavirus 2 is somewhere in the middle, right? In terms of incubation time. Um, and so they might play a role there. The problem that we have right now is that Delta is a little bit faster. So it might to a certain degree outrun uh, a, a memory B cell response. Mm. Um, so that might be one of the reasons um, why Delta infects more people who already have some immunity. So in, in any case, when um, the, the virus infects you, it's, it's going to establish itself in some cells in the respiratory tract before the memory B cells make antibody, right? Correct. So you will have some reproduction and you may have shedding as well, correct? Yes. So, I mean, that's the issue now, I think, or one of the important questions is if you are immune as a consequence of infection or vaccination, can you transmit? Do you have any... Thoughts on that? Yeah, the key answer is yes, you can. Um, unfortunately, um, there were studies, uh, there was an initial study by the CD, uh, published by the CDC where they showed that. Mm. Um, and by now we have a pretty good idea about uh, virus replication in vaccinated individuals, right? And so um, in general, Delta, the B1617.2 uh, Delta variant mm. produces relatively high titers. Uh, in the in the upper respiratory tract compared to other variants, right? Um, and in vaccinated individuals, first when people looked and compared, they were like, there's no difference, right? There's as much virus in vaccinated infected individuals as in people who, who don't have immunity, right? Um, yeah, but then there was a study from Singapore uh, that came out that actually looked at the kinetics, right? And that changes it dramatically. Yeah. Um, with Delta, the, the CT values that you measure stay low, meaning there is a lot of virus uh, for quite some time. And mm -hmm. in uh, vaccinated individuals, if there are breakthrough infections, um, the CT values are initially very low, meaning there is initially a lot of virus, um, but they change very quickly and the viral load is going down very quickly. So uh, certainly people who are infected, specifically with the Delta variant, can transmit um, but probably for a shorter period of time and, and uh, less effectively. And just for comparison, how does it compare to influenza? If you are vaccinated or have recovered, uh, will you, I assume you, you will become infected and you will shed virus. Do they transmit as well at a low rate? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I, I have to be honest. I'm not sure that mm. I, I know of a good study that looked at really asymptomatic uh, transmission in those people. I mean, the, the problem with, with flu vaccines is that, or with uh, immunity to influenza is almost everybody has been infected at some point, yeah, right? Yeah. But then you have drift and you get reinfected and the vaccines have relatively low effectiveness, right? So breakthrough infections are very common. But the, the, the vaccines prevent severe disease, I presume, very much like COVID vaccines currently do, right? Exactly, they do. Um and so that's why it's important to get the flu vaccine, even if the <clears throat> effectiveness is not as high as for measles or for COVID. I haven't had influenza since I worked on influenza with Peter Palazzi as a graduate student. I don't know why. Maybe I had a good, <laughs> maybe I saw all sorts of influenza viruses <laughs> in the lab and they immunized me. Um, now, so if you have recovered from infection, and then you get infected. What, what, what kind of disease can will you 
be mainly protected against severe disease and death? Yeah, so I think you're a little bit underselling uh, the protective effect that infection has against reinfection, right? There's also okay. very few, there were a lot of studies that came out in the time frame December, January, um, February. Uh, mm -hmm. There were relatively large studies that showed a good protective effect in the range of, you know, 80 to 90% against infection. So, you know, the endpoint was infection. Um, and then Delta came and now that changes it a little bit, right? And there's yeah, not yeah, that sure. much data, but there is a nice study from the UK uh, that shows between 70 and 80% uh, protection from infection with Delta if you had an infection before, which is in the ballpark of, of, uh, of vaccines. So certainly you have some degree of protection. Um, but going back to the point of a very heterogeneous Im immunity that is induced by infection, um, it's certainly a good thing to still get vaccinated. And as you mentioned earlier, the mm -hmm. discussion with Sarah, if you had an infection and then you get vaccinated, you almost develop something like a super immunity. So <laughs> everybody who was infected should, should really get vaccinated. And that probably gives them the best protection that they can have. Yeah, this is one of the words that the press is using, a super immunity or hybrid immunity is the other one, right? Uh, do you know if you get the same super immunity um, if you are vaccinated and then have a, an infection of some kind? Um, so I don't think there is really... Uh, a lot of data in, in terms of okay. a lot of individuals who have been characterized uh, after that. But yeah, I mean, the, the, the immune response kicks in very quickly and uh, you make a very vigorous immune response. Mm -hmm. It's just we don't have as much data as with the other way around, okay. right? All right. And to take it one step further, do you think a third vaccine dose would achieve the same super immunity? <laughs> I know well, you have to speculate, but... I have to speculate. Well, there's some data out there, right? There's a preprint from Moderna where they actually gave yeah. the third dose and they looked at that. Uh, certainly the antibody levels go up very quickly. Certainly you get uh, a relatively broad immune response. So yeah. it kind of resembles that. Um, but there are some differences in general between uh, infection-induced immunity and uh, vaccination-induced immunity. Mm -hmm. And the vaccination might not be able to do... To, basically induce the same immune response in general, right? Uh, you have to think about it. Uh, mucosal immunity usually is efficiently induced when you have um, an, an, a pathogen that is present on the mucosal surface, right? right? So you don't get that through vaccination to that degree. Um, and the other point is that if you get infected, you make a diesel response that spans basically the whole proteome of the virus. Of course, there are some epitopes that are preferentially targeted, but basically there's a lot of proteins that are expressed mm -hmm. by the virus. And for the vaccine, it's just a spike, right? So there are differences. Um, so I don't think it's equivalent um, giving three doses versus having an infection and then one dose. Mm -hmm. But certainly from the limited data that has been published, uh, the immune response after the third dose is, is pretty strong. All right. So to, to sort of summarize, how can... How do you compare? You said the natural immunity after natural infection is heterogeneous. Is it similarly heterogeneous after vaccination? No, that's the point. The, the vaccination actually uh, gives you a relatively homogeneous and relatively high response compared okay. to natural infection. Uh, so it basically, you don't have to worry about heterogeneity there uh, if you're not immunocompromised. All right. So that's a good argument for still being vaccinated if you've recovered is in addition to getting this great antibody response, right? Of course. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about uh, correlates of protection. You, you wrote a lovely uh, review article, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Um, so what is a correlate of protection and why do we care about it? Well, a correlate of protection is basically a, a measurable immune response that does correlate with protection, meaning the more of it you have, the better you are protected. Mm -hmm. um, and that might be directly connected to protection or it might be indirectly connected to protection. So it could either be something that really uh, an immune measure of immune response that really protects you, uh, or it could be 
uh, an immune response that correlates with a different type of immune response and that different type of immune response that you don't measure uh, protects you. So um, it's mm -hmm. basically something that you can measure that tells you how good your protection is. And when you say protection, you have to define what you're Oh yes, that too right, <laughs> and and that's that has been a that has created a lot of confusion, right? Also, specifically when we look at different vaccines and we compare, and you see that in the media quite a, quite a bit, mm -hmm. they compare uh, efficacy data from the clinical trials, which had certain endpoints, to effectiveness data, uh, which now use a completely different endpoint, and then they say, oh, we went from ninety four to sixty six percent. Uh, and it's apples and oranges, right? So you always have to to define that, um, what your endpoint is and what, mm. what their criteria is. If it's uh, just infection, if it's symptomatic infection, if it's severe disease, if it's death. Yeah, and um, you, you mentioned in your article that it's much easier to measure antibody levels, right? So that is clinically more useful because T-cell measurements are hard, right? Correct. And I think that's also one of the reasons why most of the correlates of protection that we have for other viruses are antibody based. It's just easier to measure. Yeah. Um, there is no, no, uh, no doubt that uh, in, in most cases, T cells really contribute to protection, but it's harder to measure them. It costs more and it takes longer time. And so that's, that's really the problem. But we should emphasize that even though they're easier, they're still useful, right? It's not like we're just taking the easy way out, right? No, no, I mean, so we're, we're you can look at, at the correlates as mechanistic correlates, meaning that what you measure actually gives you the protection as I right. just said, right. um, or you can have a correlate that is not really the mechanism of protection, but it correlates with the, with yep. the immune response that the mechanism. But for antibodies, we know that they are protective, right? So from, from studies in non-human primates, uh, you know, if you transfer uh, immune mm -hmm. uh, or positive zero from one, any, from one non-human primate to another one and challenge, uh, they're protected and that's in a dose dependent manner. Uh, the monoclonal antibodies that we give early on uh, to as a therapy, therapeutic for, for COVID-19, they work very well. And there's now two papers out there that actually uh, find a very nice uh, correlation between, specifically between the antibody response and protection. And they try to define uh, the data that you need to be protected, although we have to be careful with that because it's not like if you're above a dieter, you're protected. If you're below, you're not mm. protected. It's, of course, a probability that, that comes with a certain antibody level. Um, but those uh, were published relatively recently, and uh, they're really nice nice papers. So wh why do we want to know a correlate of protection? What's, what are the practical uses? Well, there is a number of practical uses. First of all, People have, a, or vaccine companies, specifically smaller vaccine companies in, in low and middle income countries have now uh, issues to, uh, to basically um, placebo controlled trials, right? Uh, first of all, it's hard to recruit people mm. when they know that there's a placebo group and they might not get a vaccine and they, you know, might just get the vaccine that is available instead. Um, and then um, yeah. as there's more and more uh, immunity in the population. Um, you also have pre-existing immunity from infection. Uh, the trials need to get bigger. It's, it's very costly, but there's another way to do that. You can just do immunobridging. You can compare, compare it to an, an arm that you include in your trial that just that arm gets a, a licensed vaccine or an mm -hmm. authorized vaccine. And if the immune response is as good, then you can say, okay, uh, this vaccine now works as well, uh, and that would me make more vaccine available. But you can only do that if what you're measuring is actually a correlate of protection, because otherwise you can't say, oh, it's as good, right? Um, so that's one uh, one very important uh, use for correlate of protection. That's the most important right now, because uh, as Sarah just said, uh, we don't have enough vaccine to cover the global yeah. population. And... The other uses are, of course, you can tell somebody, okay, you you have a high level of antibody likely protected, yeah. or your antibody level is too low, you should get a booster dose, right? Yeah. So yeah. that that helps too. 
And a lot of people are getting antibody tests and they have the numbers and they say, what do these mean? <laughs> you can't say anything, right? Um, so um, for influenza, you you have a good correlative protection, right? Because there's so many years of work on it. Correct. We have the HIA titer, which is not a perfect correlate, um, mm -hmm. but uh, it, you know, explains a high percentage of protection. Mm -hmm. And it's actually used to, to license vaccines based based on just an immune readout, right? So sure, sure. Um, you can license a vaccine just because a certain proportion of your vaccinated individuals reach a certain HIA titer, and you don't have to do a field study where you really look at uh, protection from infection or disease. And, and I suppose that also plays into the decision, the decision every year whether to change the flu vaccine or not, right? Of course. Uh, if you see a certain drop, mm -hmm. um, then the against the circulating viruses, then you right. need to, to update right. the uh, composition of the vaccine. Now, you, in your review article or commentary, you talked about these two studies, uh, but they're modeling studies, right? So we don't yet have a an actual correlate for, for COVID that would be useful, right? We do. That. There is a preprint out from uh, Moderna and uh, mm -hmm. the BRC was part of it, uh, where they looked at the Moderna trial. And they yep. actually established the numbers um, okay. in international units, actually, and in, in uh, binding uh, units. Uh, and there is another um, another paper out from, I think, David Goldblatt's lab uh, that did the same. So uh, okay. since these initial papers came out, uh, there is now more data that ah. can really drill down and tell you approximately what data you need. Because in the... One of the in the modeling papers, they they had compared, they had come up with a number with respect to convalescent serum titers neutralization, right? I think protection against any COVID was twenty percent of the levels of uh, convalescent serum, but protection against serious disease, severe disease, and death was only three percent. So why is that so low? There's probably a difference. Um, so. Antibodies are probably needed to protect you from infection uh, mm -hmm. and from mild infection. Um, but once the the you know virus takes hold and, and starts to replicate, uh, yeah. the D cell response becomes very important, right? Uh, uh, infected cells need to get cleared and so on and so forth. And okay. so um, you know that might actually you might actually have a, a kind of a, um, a model where, where two different types of immune responses mm -hmm. protect you from two different types of of uh, endpoints in a way, right? You have the antibody response that protects you from even getting infected, but if you get infected sure. and you don't have enough antibody, the diesel response kicks in and protects you from from getting severely sick. Got it. And that's probably why the vaccines can still protect against variants, severe disease. Uh caused by the variants because of the T-cell response. Yes, I assume that uh, that is a big uh, big part of uh, of the protection. But mm -hmm. let's not forget, I mean, the vaccine effectiveness against infection is dropping, but it's sure. not zero, right? It's actually still pretty robust, uh, specifically for the mRNA vaccine. So it, it depends on, on, on the individual, um, but it's not like the vaccines don't work anymore against the infection, right? They still do work. Yeah, of course, if you listen to the news, you, that's what you would conclude, right? <laughs> that they're not working anymore. Let's, uh, let's for the last few minutes, just chat about influenza. Um, the, the flu season last year was very minimal, right? Um, probably as a consequence of lockdowns and masking. So what are, what are we going to see this fall when more people are back to uh, normal? What, what are your predictions for the influenza season? Yeah, that's a super interesting topic. I would like to know too. Um, so I, I don't think flu is gone, right? And if you look globally, there are certainly cases that are reported to the WHO. There are sequencing sequences put out, um, but it's certainly also going through bottlenecks, right? Um, yeah, H3 yeah. before the pandemic was split up in many different clades, which made vaccine um, uh, formulation really difficult. And not all of these clades might come back when flu comes back. Uh, for influenza B, we have an interesting situation 
uh, it has to flu B has to antigenically different lineages, right? Victoria and Yamagata, and there's barely any detected Yamagata cases. I think mm. they found two in the last year. I think that close to that. Well, there were a few hundred or even a few thousand Victoria cases. So there might be a bottleneck too, right? And so the diversity, at least in the in the in the short run, might be a little bit lower with influenza viruses. Um, now. The problem that I see is they're still around and I think they will come back. If that happens in this season or if it happens next season, that's a different question. Mm -hmm. uh, but the problem that we might face is, uh, so there is now uh, kids that have never seen an influenza infection. Mm -hmm. And typically with flu, you also get asymptomatic infection and you have relatively high attack rates every year in the population. And what that does is it, it maintains a baseline immunity uh, mm -hmm. And now this is kind of gone. And so when flu comes back, uh, there might be actually, a, you know, we might actually look at the relatively severe flu season when it comes back, just because right. there are a lot of kids that can amplify it. And adults also have less immunity than usual. So it's, it's going to be an interesting situation. But again, I, I, <clears throat> it's really hard to predict if that would happen this year or next year. And of course, if that happens, then we have combined with COVID, maybe, you know, we have two respiratory diseases occurring at the same time, large outbreaks. That could be a big problem. It could be. But on the other side, what we have seen in the in the last two years is that um, people, the uptake in, in flu vaccines has gone up uh, because people are aware yeah, uh, yeah. Of, more aware of viruses and more aware that there is a vaccine against influenza. And that's the nice thing. There is a vaccine against influenza and uh, you can prevent disease. So uh, my hope is that people will just get vaccinated or at least the majority yeah. uh, and that that would mitigate any kind of larger waves. Yes, get, get both vaccines, influenza and COVID vaccines. Have the flu vaccines been updated for the next season? Yeah, yeah, they have been updated i mean the who meets the problem is they don't have that much data right so it's a little yeah. bit harder to make decisions about it mm -hmm. um but yes yeah that's a, that's what i've been asked a lot is it do you have enough data to to know because there's been less circulation but they've made a decision anyway right they did okay all right, Florian, thank you so much uh, for joining me today from Mount Sinai School of Medicine here in New York. Florian Kramer, thanks so much. Thanks for the invitation. And when uh, if the flu season gets interesting, or actually in any at any rate, I want to get you back and talk about flu vaccines because that's your other area of work, right? Exactly. That will so, be fun. Let's do that. Let's do that this uh, this winter. Part two of this Special episode of TWIV, This Week in Virology, coming to you from the meeting of the European Society for Clinical Virology. I have now four uh, guests to chat with me about how each of their countries uh, responded to the pandemic and the lessons learned for the next one, because as we know, there will be a next one. So please welcome today from Fondazione Policlinico San Matteo and the University of Pavia, Fausto Baltanti. Welcome to TWIV. From Norgellens Hospital in Denmark, Thea Fischer, welcome back. Magatak. You're getting to be a regular. <laughs> from Erasmus Medical Center in the Netherlands, Ron Fouché. Welcome back, Ron. Always a pleasure, Richard. Ron is another regular on TWIV. And finally, from Public Health Wales in Cardiff, UK, Catherine Moore. Welcome to TWIV. Thank you. Hi. Thank you all for joining to chat with me for the next hour or so about uh, our individual experiences. And I want to first start by asking each of you briefly to set, tell me what you were doing uh, before the pandemic and, and how that changed uh, once the pandemic began. Um, so Fausto, uh, why don't you start and tell us? Yes. So we were on alert already since the January, so the end of December, but in January, we already had the primers for running PCRs and we were actually involved in checking travelers from China because that were the indications 
and nobody was positive. But uh, one night I was here at uh, 8 uh, p.m. So, and there is a weird sequence of number, okay? 20 of February, so 2002, 2020, at 8 p.m. at 20.00 came a sample that was from a patient in a, in a small hospital in the surrounding of Pavia, south of Milan, and that patient was positive. That was a patient not having travel. That was a patient without any contact with China or travelers from China. And uh, in that precise moment, we knew that we had the virus uh, in, in our region that was spreading around. In the next day, uh, we and another hospital in Milan, we were checking the contacts and we found hundreds mm. of positive cases. So three days later, that surrounding, that uh, area, was locked down. In that area are living uh, almost 50,000 individuals. And later on, we discovered that at the time, we discovered the first positive case, and 10,000, so 25% were positive. Meaning that the virus had the chance to uh, spread out for a month. We could track the origin of the, the epidemics in Italy in uh, about starting uh, uh, the second half of January. We did by serology, by checking symptoms, by, uh, of course, molecular assays. And we could demonstrate that already at the full-blown epidemics in Lombardy, we had already seven different lineages. Mm meaning that the virus was also seeded in, in Lombardy, already mutated seven times. And that's weird, meaning that the, the, uh, the start of the epidemics was, was a multiple start. And uh, another important finding, you know, that there were initially two big outbreaks in Lombardy. Lombardy is a region in Italy, in the north of Italy, uh, with 10 million inhabitants, it is the mostly densely populated in Italy and uh, better connected to um, inside and outside Italy. Uh, the center of this uh, region is Milan. Okay. Well, uh, the the strange uh, case of these uh, epidemics in in Lombardy is the multiple seeding of the virus in a, in a period that was a flu season. So the mm -hmm. virus entered several times. Uh, we were checking the airports, no virus entering through the airports, maybe in other ways, and uh, spreading around for one month, unrecognized among mm -hmm. uh, flu uh, infections. That was the start of the epidemics. And uh, in this region, the, the first wave was stopped by locking down the entire region. And then Italy, as you know, uh, it was stopped within two months. At the end of May, no additional cases were recorded. And so the first wave faded down. During the, the summer of 2020, the virus spread out in, uh, in Italy. And the second wave, wave was much higher. Uh, so I sure remember exactly, not only the day, but the very moment mm. we received the sample, because that was a date, that is a weird sequence of number yeah. to zero to zero zero two, that was really changing everything. Yeah. Shaya, how did uh, things change for you in the beginning of 2020? Well, I think just overall, uh, my life changed as I was enjoying my life prior to the pandemic <laughs> as a research director at uh, the largest acute uh, university hospital in the capital region. And uh, it just happened to coincide with also planning um, 
a pandemic response and preparedness model uh, for a huge uh, grant application. So that just happened to coincide with uh, December 19 and January 2020. Mm. So that was just kind of overall what was going on before the the pandemic uh, hit uh, Europe and uh, Denmark. And then afterwards, like others, you were completely immersed. And of course, we have heard your experience on the WHO committee on another TWIV. Exactly. That has been part of the, the job. I think everybody around this table have been working. Yeah. We say in Danish, the, working the sun black. And that has been also the case in my, uh, yeah, in my life. Working the sun black. Is that how it goes? That's, That's good. I like that. <laughs> how about you, Ron? Before you were doing influenza, I suppose, right? <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm a flu guy, so I, I'm probably one of the more relaxed people uh, from among this crowd because I, I'm, I was also in the fortunate position that I'm in a very large virology department where the head of the department is actually a coronavirus expert by training. And we have a coronavirus team uh, headed by Bart Haagmans too. So Marion mm. Koopmans and Bart Haagmans both mm. uh, got their PhD working on coronaviruses. And so... Very early in the pandemic, uh, I think it was January, mm. when uh, Italy was experiencing the first cases and the first cases started to appear in the Netherlands. We had a brief meeting where we decided on the chain of command. And the chain of command uh, was uh, the top of the command chain was Marion Koopmans because she is a coronavirus expert. Mm -hmm. And so I decided that, well, we decided that it would not be good to have three captains on one ship. So two would be enough. And so my team uh, was ju just playing supportive roles. So my, my team assisted uh, in the initial diagnostic uh, capacity building. A lot of uh, full genome sequencing. We do that for flu routinely during the flu seasons. And so all of that infrastructure and capacity was shifted to COVID. So I temporarily had very few people in, in my team. And of course, what we did participate in uh, as a team is also in the research uh, capabilities. Mm -hmm. So we started to set up animal models. We did non-human primate studies very early on to study pathogenesis. We set up animal models to study uh, vaccine effectiveness or develop vaccines, test mm -hmm. drugs, test transmission of virus. So I've, I've been mostly involved in the in the most fun part, the research part, and not so much in the diagnostic response myself. Have, have you been more recently able to, to return to some influenza work? Yes, we certainly do. And we have to because the flu season is coming. We are <laughs> So I'm also heading the uh, Erasmus component of the Dutch National Influenza Center, mm. and we're starting. We are starting to see the start of the uh, the, the flu season, I think, which might be early this year. Mm. We have uh, lots of travelers coming back with flu in mm. um, you know, reasonable numbers, and so I think uh, we're going to be busy with a uh, with flu again over the next coming months. Catherine, how about you? What were you doing just before and how did that change? Uh, well, just before. So my, my job in Wales is um, I'm the lead for respiratory virus diagnosis, but I also bring in um, molecular tests and move the technology forward. And we work as a network of laboratories and Cardiff being the centres of the Wales Specialist Virology Centre where I'm set at. And in December, we were preparing for a bad flu season, to be honest. So we'd already begun to um, map H3N2 around Wales and it noted that we'd had about four clades of H3N2 circulating, um, three of which weren't matching very well with the vaccine. And I think I picked up some news reports sort of towards the end of December to say that this new virus or this new outbreak had happened in China. And I remember sending a WhatsApp message to a, the group of scientists that I work with that on the emerging virus response to say, oh, look, you know, this, this could be something. Um, and then obviously by the time sort of New Year had happened, we sort of recognised that actually what we were dealing with was a new virus. Um, and so as soon as the um, primers and probes were released by WHO, um, which obviously came out of the Dutch lab largely from um, Christian's group, um, we all did the primers. And then interestingly, the ESTV had an emerging workshop, um, emerging mm -hmm. virus workshop, which I think a lot of, number of us attended. I, I know Ron was there. Um, and we were chatting about sort of the emerging, this emerging virus at that point. And I came back on the Monday from that meeting. And in the three days 
when I come back, I set up the test ready to go. And, you know, essentially, you know, all, all hell broke loose. And, you know, there's no, there's no, you know, suddenly we were bombarded with this. We need to do this, this, this now. Mm. Um, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure we were really entirely prepared, you know, for, for what was going to come, you know, and, and, you know, looking back now, I, th- I just think that was actually quite calm. You know, what came next just seemed to be absolute carnage, to be honest. Mm. We had our first case confirmed um, on the 27th of February, um, and that was an arriving traveller from Italy. Obviously, we've been looking at China to bring the virus across to us, and it came from much closer. You know, we'd obviously not had our eye on the ball so much. Um, And since then, we've um, set up the network testing um, with, you know, so the whole of Wales now is is competent to test for COVID. We've got our high throughput testing centre locally in Wales um, to to map against that that we've got in the UK in in Hull. Um, So, yeah, it was it was a quiet start. But I I think certainly those news reports at the end of December really sort of, you know, woke us up. You know, something's going on here and we need to respond Mm -hmm. Flu. It was all flu at the time. Australian flu, I think, was the virus that we had at the time. <laughs> hmm. All right. So let's talk about how your individual countries uh, responded. Um, we've heard a little bit about that so far. Now, Fausto, you said the initial response was a lockdown, right? Um, what else? What else was done besides that? Can you give us a sense of uh, what other measures were taken? Yes. The initial response was the lockdown and, uh, of course, uh, implementing measures uh, for containment of uh, respiratory virus within the hospitals. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were, we are lucky in our hospitals because we have the infectious disease department and the microbiology department that are in a separate building from the remaining part of the hospital. And so it was immediately separated. And uh, also an emergency room was built into the uh, the building and a small um, ICU within the infectious diseases building. So the building is uh, four stories. And uh, so in, it, in two stories, infectious diseases, ICU, emergency, and uh, microbiology. So trying to contain in that way. And uh, that took the first week. So our... Uh, workers, they were working uh, day or night to actually build the lines for mm-hmm. oxygen. That was one of the well uh, most striking uh, need oxygen when you need oxygen. So uh, now you guess that the number, the actual number, initial number of patients altogether immediately coming in serious condition was the real critical situation, not diagnostic, but the handling of the sick sick people, the highly Mm. uh, compromised individuals. Italy has a population that is really old. So we are the oldest country uh, together with Japan. Mm. And that was for sure one factor uh, that was in important in the in the initial phase of the situation. So you said you, you did two lockdowns, right? Um, it, it was it, a, yes, initial, initial lockdown of the Lodi 11 municipalities mm-hmm. and the second lockdown that was a lockdown of the entire uh, Lombardy and immediately after that, the entire Italy. Mm-hmm. And following the first wave, uh, there was a more uh, selective uh, use of uh, lockdown with um, colors, with colors uh, indicating the number of positives over mm-hmm. hundred thousand inhabitants, and so the growing the curve and entering and exit this uh, fractionated lockdown situation. Yeah. So what? So what did you also have masking mandates? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Throughout the country. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Um, what? What about testing? How did that develop? Well, the testing, of course, in December, nobody had the test, 
Mm -hmm. The sequence of the virus was released on January 6th of 2020. And on January 15, we already had the the, the assays, the PCR mm -hmm. in, in the lab. So the testing was there. But initially, only in Lombardy, only three reference lab had the assay. Mm -hmm. And there was a scaling up of the potential testing, the, the power of testing that was spread from the initial three labs. The initial month was really a mess. We had hundreds, thousands of samples coming and uh, with this uh, unmade essay to be, to be run. Mm -hmm. After that, in the starting from month two of the, the infection, you see uh, 12, 15, 20, 30, uh, other labs came up, and uh, so it was really much easier. And similarly, all over it. So the testing remains to this day, obviously, right? Yes, sure. And more and more uh, samples are run per day uh, today mm -hmm. because, you know, there is a green, the green pass uh, approach and... Uh, if you're not vaccinated with double dose, uh, mm -hmm. still not vaccinated, you have to take the, the swab. Uh, so it's been implemented quite uh, in detail. So when did vaccines uh, begin to be distributed in Italy? I was the first vaccinated in, uh, no, the first, <laughs> the first in my hospital <laughs> because they also needed <laughs> testimonial. And so I, I was actually the first receiving the shot mm -hmm. uh, and all the healthcare workers were vaccinated with uh, Pfizer because it was the first available uh, vaccine. And it occurred in on 27 of December, 2020. And what today, what's the coverage? Do you have any sense? Yes, I have, exactly. So in Lombardy is higher than 80% with mm -hmm. double dose. Overall, Italy is a 75% double dose. Uh, so pretty high. You, th you think it will get higher than that, 75? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. because the, um, the campaign is still ongoing. And from next Monday, it will start the third dose for the fragile uh, individuals. Mm. Got it. So Thea, your country has done very well. Um, I, I read today that um, all restrictions are lifted, right? You can go anywhere you'd like. Exactly. <laughs> so how did, how did you do that? Well, um, we, as everybody else, had, um, had the severe restrictions um, put in place. Uh, in Denmark, it was on March 10th when the government, 2020, when the government classified COVID-19 mm -hmm. as an uh, illness that posed a clinical threat to society. So because of the, and then we have since then have, uh, have the, um, had the, uh, restriction with the face masks, social distance, closing of universities, schools, etc., on off during the the, the various uh, epidemic waves in the country. But as of September 10th, it has now been decided that we are at a safe place uh, with the epidemic. Mm -hmm. We have reached uh, a coverage above 80 for the risk population, and um, for the general population, it's 74 percent. And that does not include children um, um, less than 12. So they are numbered in when we say the 74%, but they have not been offered vaccine drug. So I think we're doing pretty well. And I think thanks to the vaccines, we now have the epidemic in Denmark under uh, good control. But as the Minister of Health also said, it is uh, we are now lifting all the bans, but we are ready to implement then we implement them quite fast in mm -hmm. case we see the same situation as happened in uh, in the Netherlands back in July, that um, that the epidemic might, because of the Delta waves, uh, come forcefully back. But as of now, um, it's looking pretty good, actually. Uh, so I, I assume testing had played a large role in this, right? Can you give us a description? 
Yes, um, I think uh, it's fair enough to say that during the first month, actually all couple of months during the spring of 2020, we were a bit um, taken back by the fact that the epidemic hit so fast mm -hmm. and we did not have a preparedness response in terms of diagnostic platforms that, I could, that could actually um, encounter the, 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 the very acute need. So it took a little while to get the platform set up in all the hospitals. And in the beginning, it was only the State and Salem Institute and some of the, the larger hospitals that were actually able to offer the testing, why the clinical case definition also in Denmark was quite strict in February and March on who could be tested. Uh, but then thanks to a quite um, strong collaboration with universities and uh, bigger public health labs, it was possible to not off only offer um, a very fast and um, quite comprehensive testing platform in, I think, around April, but also to uh, start sequencing, which has also picked up speed very fast. So mm. I think by August 2020, we were able to sequence uh, almost 10% of all our positive COVID samples. And I think that has been a tremendous help in, um, in actually... Uh, for the for the public health interventions planning that we were able to see once the various mutants of their concern um, they were introduced in the population and tried to plan ahead. I'm I'm curious as in situations like schools, I, I presume schools were open at some point. Was testing part of returning to school? Uh, absolutely. After the second wave, which hit us um, really badly in February, uh, sorry, third wave, I should say, or it was the continuation of the second wave, actually, <laughs> but it got bad in the spring of 21. Mm -hmm. We had to go back to closing schools, and um, that was the longest uh, school closure uh, that we have had so far because the, the young kids were not allowed back to schools before August. They have just been allowed back in in August, so yeah. I think it's been that way. It's been a tough spring for all the young people. So, if if how how frequently would would school people so school the testing in school? Then, when they were allowed back, it was first implemented that for the first weeks of August, that mm -hmm. the kids would be regularly uh, tested, mm -hmm. um, and it, I think it was twice a week. Um, and some of, some children were allowed to continue schools, children with special needs. Um, so they were actually allowed to continue in the school system during the spring, but they needed to have uh, negative tests twice a week. And also the, all the restrictions related to being a contact of a known case were in place. So even though you were not having symptoms and even though you had negative tests, in case you had been a contact to a known case, you were also mm. uh, forced to be isolated. Um, okay. Uh -huh. And do do antigen tests play any role in your approach? Well, uh, antigen tests was not part of the government offer initially or the public offer initially, but mm. uh, I think around uh, the fall of 2020, as they were validated and a few of the platforms were tested and found to be uh, of acceptable um, quality, sensitivity and specificity, they were actually implemented and also quite rapidly. Mm. And I think among big social gatherings, it has been quite uh, a used uh, testing system, but also for many young people's, people who might not have the patience to wait for several days for the more sensitive and more specific PCR. Mm. Going into a bar was a requirement that you could show a negative uh, test and antigen test were, were, were quite used for, for mm. them. So what did you say your vaccine coverage was currently? Again, so currently it's about 80 for the risk population and okay. 75 for the general population. And you think that can also be raised, right? Well, I think um, as, as of now, we have tried uh, for the past two months uh, to offer vaccines and they are for free as in most other European countries, but without a big success of picking up speed. So I think we might be more or less at a stable um, proportion now. And we have just um, two weeks ago started using the, the third booster dose for the immunocompromised and mm -hmm. last week for the elderly homes where we have seen some epidemic spread of the Delta variant amongst those vaccinated. Okay.
Now, Ron, I know you're involved in the research end, but do you have do you have an overview of how the Netherlands responded? Uh, sure. The, uh, so it started uh, with Carnival in our country. So Carnival was a big party, which is in contrast to Carnival in Brazil. It's because it's in the winter. It's uh, it's indoors. <laughs> and so by the end of February, uh, people came back from uh, winter sport in Austria and Italy and Switzerland and then started partying in Carnival in the south in bars. And that uh, didn't go so well. So by the end of February, we saw uh, hospitals filling up in the south of the Netherlands. And then mm-hmm. by early March came the first uh, recommendations for implementations initially focused on the south just uh, so, so big people to stay home when they were sick and people to keep distance people stop shaking hands and making contact so that was initially focused on the south but very rapidly just a week later i think uh, it was rolled out over the entire country and by the end of march uh, we started closing nursing homes and things like that so mm-hmm. it spread around really quick uh we had a very good response in the sense that it was very science-based. So the we have our outbreak management team consisting of many virologists, epidemiologists, medical doctors, and in general, the government would follow those uh, recommendations uh, pretty strict. Um, but there uh, were also discussions on, for instance, the use of face masks, because initially there wasn't really any data on the effectiveness of that. And so I think the Netherlands was one of the last countries to start to recommend the use of face masks because it just wasn't a very strong evidence base for it initially. But when Tony Fauci and the WHO started to advocate the use of face masks, I I think our government couldn't do anything but uh, do the same thing. And so, uh, yeah, just like everywhere, testing um, initial capacity was low, but uh, it was remarkable how fast the capacity went up. And uh, with the capacity going up, uh, I think it became more clear who should stay home and who should uh, uh, be quarantined, et cetera. And that certainly uh, helped. Mm -hmm. Um, We had major discussions on school closure at some point because early in the pandemic, there was no evidence that kids were spreading it. And so the advice of the Dutch government for a long time had been to keep the schools open uh, but also there, there started to be some uh, opposition from teachers and school heads. And mm-hmm. under pressure, the Dutch government then decided to close the schools nevertheless. Although, again, at that point, the scientific basis for it was still weak. And so, but I, I think on the whole, the government has followed uh, scientific advice well, with the exception of the example that they had just mentioned when in July... Uh, we tried to reopen. Uh, the advice was to reopen uh, bars only for people that were vaccinated. But the government decided then that if you got vaccinated in the morning, that you could go out to the pub at night. <laughs> and so <laughs> that was a not such a smart comment because, of course, you open the bars and the youth, mm. is after a year of lockdown, is free to go to the bars. They they will get vaccinated, but they are not yet protected. And that's what we saw. Hmm. And so that was a very silly uh, decision uh, for which we had to pay seriously because that meant another lockdown. And only now are we starting to reopen again uh, slowly Hmm. with Corona passes, but now upon proper incubation period of the vaccination Mm -hmm. and or negative testing results. What is the current vaccine coverage in your country? We're approaching uh, 82% in the over 18. Um, The youth is still, so the under 18 is still trailing behind. But that is now increasing very rapidly because they can only go out to bars if they're vaccinated. So we put no pressure on them, of course. But Mm -hmm. you can only go out to a bar either if you're fully vaccinated or tested. So vaccination coverage is now going up also in the under 18, and there are still uh, uh, serious attempts to increase from the 82% in the over 80, and in particular in the non native Dutch speaking persons, which seem to be not, uh, uh, we, we seem to have a hard time sometimes to approach these people. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's still work going on uh, in the major cities in the areas where uh, lots of uh, foreigners live uh, that do not speak Dutch so well. So, Catherine, uh, Wales is known for really expanding testing. Um, yes. And so I'd love to hear a bit about that. Okay. So, um, yeah, we started off small, obviously, um, with the one lab down in um, the southeast of Wales. Um, but it was very clear that we weren't going to be able to sort of maintain the testing for the whole country, um, particularly um, as, you know, trying to get samples from North Wales down to South Wales. So we brought in um, various sort of platforms, not only um, sort of mass testing platforms, but also rapid um, platforms for hospital patients so that the, as soon as they came in through the front door, they could be tested um, by a local laboratory. So we put um, what we call hot labs into um, hospitals, which hadn't previously had microbiology before, you know, or they, it had been closed down many years before. Um, so we now have, a, I think, a complete network, you know, if you include the hot labs of about 15, 16 laboratories across Wales who you can for a rapid test and a, and a full platform. And in addition to that, um, we also set up a mass testing lab um, in the southeast of Wales where samples from the community and from care homes, for example, um, where outbreaks had been identified could be fed into for just um, SARS-CoV-2 testing. Uh, so we have, a, you know, our capacity is pretty good in Wales. And then if you add on to that, we also fed into the um, Department of Health and Social Security UK network. Um, they set up the Lighthouse Labs, which is quite well known in, in the UK. These are the really high mass testing laboratories, you know, 50, 60,000 samples a day in each of these sites. And um, we have a mega lab, which is just open. So, so when we need to, we can feed into those, um, certainly for asymptomatic screening. So in terms of testing, um, yeah, we, we've managed to get it up and running but it wasn't particularly easy because of the shortages that, you know, we had, you know, going into that. I mean, to be honest, I mean, Brexit, you know, it's not been a great thing for us entirely in terms of supply. But because we had stockpiled in expect expectation for there to be problems, we used some of that stockpile to help us set up some of this testing. Um, so, yeah, our capacity is good. Um, we maintain so even some of our rural parts of Wales have access to a rapid test should, should it be required. Um, so yeah, we're there. Um, it's it's still it's still a struggle sometimes, but you know we're we're, we're getting at it. We're, we're still going. So clearly, early on, you recognised the value of testing. Not everyone yes. did, right? I, uh, yeah, and I don't really get that because it, <laughs> in every in every other um, in every other infection, we have a test for it. You know, how can you identify that somebody's got an infection without testing um i suppose you know what we we have the situation at the moment is that we are testing absolutely everybody in the community as well so we're counting mm. cases rather than counting you know the, the the severe end of the spectrum which is what we would normally do in a routine laboratory we're normally testing symptomatic people where there is a defined action for that symptomatic person and that seems to not be the case so much we're testing far more asymptomatic people um and as you know in the uk we're far more open than probably anywhere at the moment you know we've opened um you know our lives up and you know so we're, we're testing lots of people but there's no ne not necessarily any action a lot of it's advisory okay you've tested positive please isolate for 10 days whether or not people will do that is is another matter, you know, because mm -hmm. a lot of people, life has moved on because of the vaccines. The vaccines have just been so good. Yeah. How, how does how does your testing work in school situations? So um, we will lateral flow. So used um, quite widely now. So, you know, a lot of children will have a lateral flow test. Um, it can be sort of twice weekly. Um if, if they're symptomatic, they'll take a lateral flow, not go to school. Um, but again, pr prior to this period where we're opened up now, we used to have the schools in bubbles. So a year group would form a bubble. So if one case tested positive, the whole year group would be isolated from the school. And that disrupted, um, you know, quite a lot of children's education, because even if they weren't necessarily close to that, to the case, you know, because they were in the same bubble, they would all be isolated um, and so sort of our move forward from that has been, you know, that, the, you know, a lateral flow test, if that's negative, um, mm. 
to your asymptomatic, then you can still go into school. Okay. And what what is the vaccine coverage at the moment in Wales? So for 16s and overs, um, our current vaccine coverage is just uh, for one dose is 91%. And we are at 85% for two doses in 16, 16s and overs. Wonderful. So let's now think about um, how, what we've learned and how can we apply it to be ready uh, for the next one. I don't, Fausto, what do you think uh, is the, are some of the lessons that can be used uh, to respond better next time? Because we can always do better, right? Well, <clears throat> well uh, network networking is was important, of mm -hmm. course, and uh, also having a plan for scaling up the testing capacity and scaling up also the uh, admittance capacity, because we don't know what kind of a new uh, disease we will approach. Mm -hmm. For sure, for sure, uh, the role of um, reference lab is crucial, but we need something that is automatically scaling up according to the, to the situation. We might have a big outbreak in a single region, in a single country, or mm -hmm. a new pandemic again. So uh, something that is fast and flexible, I think uh, it is important. At, and much more networked, much more coordinated. Uh, in Italy, we have 20 different regions and re each region was moving in a separate way initially. That was for sure a, a major problem. So um, a sort of guidelines, a general guidelines, maybe at European level would be uh, much needed in my opinion. And we have the same country in the U.S. We have 50 states who uh, each think they're a different country. And it's really hard to coordinate them. Does your country have a pandemic plan? Or did it or does it have one now? It's for me? Yeah, uh, Fausto, sorry. Yeah. Yes. It, was this in place before this the current pandemic or is it new? Well, there is one new for sure. And there was a debate on how it was... Uh, <laughs> it was good or not the previous one, and I don't want to get into that, Karel, uh, <laughs> please. Sure. Okay, it's good to have one at least. Uh, we threw ours out apparently before the current pandemic. Um, so Thea, what have you learned for the next, by the way, um, I suppose the next one will be either influenza or coronavirus, right? That seems to be the the, the main ones, right? What's your, what are your plans, Thea? So uh, in order to be better prepared, we now have uh, this home uh, care model that, um, mm -hmm. that we have developed at the hospital and that's now ready to go air. That is uh, a flexible model where you can, uh, it's very uh, fast scalable. So you can go from one patient, five patients to 1,000 patients in a days. And we'll be able, able to um, ensure the hospital's capacity uh, by um, by using this model, so it's it's simply based of a of of an app, two technical uh, solutions, a mobile app for the patients, and a case management system for the for the staff at the hospital. So that has been uh, developed during the past year while mm -hmm. on all the research alone uh, for COVID. But this uh, model, I uh, I believe, will be one of the best preparedness models that we actually can offer to the healthcare system. And it will be evidence-based as we uh, we test it as a research project to make sure that we have all the needed systematically um, uh, collected uh, data mm -hmm. and evaluated. So we start with a feasibility study and then we'll continue with a, um, a randomized clinical trial. Did you have a plan in place before the pandemic? We had a national pandemic preparedness plan in place in Denmark uh, in accordance with the IHR and the WHO um, requirements. Mm -hmm. And I've actually done a small study recently where I have um, interviewed people at different levels of the healthcare system 
and right. interviewed them about the use of the plan, the knowledge of the ex- existence of the plan, and then secondary to that question, the the, the practical use of the plan uh, during the pandemic. So we have had a chance to evaluate how well it actually worked and, and didn't work. I heard today that the EU is put together a committee for pandemic planning. I don't, so how does that work? It seems like many countries have their own plan. Do you have any sense for that, Thea? I, I do not know about a <laughs> EU uh, pandemic uh, board, but I know that WHO is now establishing the, the new uh, SATO, it's called, uh, mm-hmm. which would be a framework for a more permanent uh, response to pandemics. And it's based on uh, a cross-disciplinary a uh, number of scientists from all various backgrounds. So that's what okay. I know about. Okay. Did your country, Ron, have a pandemic plan? Of course we did. <laughs> but uh, it, it usually ends up in people's drawers at the bottom somewhere after a few years. Yeah. So, and then doesn't get updated. So, but we did have pandemic plans, yes. And much of what we've learned now was already in that plan. So, okay. Unfortunately, I wanted to ask you about something slightly different, and that is you you are direct the BSL three laboratory, right? I don't think you you're involved with BSL four at all, right? No, just BSL three, um, and you know you have to work on SARS CoV two in a BSL three. You've known you've worked in it on influenza virus for years. So how does that how did that become useful uh, during the pandemic? And is that something that should be part of a plan in a country that could do it. Absolutely. The, um, I think one of the things that we've learned in this pandemic is the value of vaccines. And uh, over the last 13 years, my lab and many other labs with BSL three or four mm-hmm. facilities have worked on SARS vaccine and MERS vaccine. And without those pieces of information, I think, uh, the current vaccines would have been slower. The mRNA vaccines and the adenovirus vectors and the recombinant protein vaccines have been tested under international programs for Ebola, Zika, influenza, SARS, MERS. And so all of that work is is hard work in the BSL-3 and when it comes to Ebola or Hendra and Nipah, even BSL-4. And so it's absolutely critical we continue to do that because I think everybody's convinced now how much the vaccines contribute to uh, halting this, the impact of this pandemic. And the only way to do it well after, so I, I think one of the things we, we should do in our BSL-3s and 4s is try to do research to prevent pandemics. Yeah. But if we cannot do that, and I'm sure we'll miss some, uh, then we need vaccines and drugs, and th- those are developed in laboratories like mine. And uh, of course, once then the pandemic happens, the industry needs to uh, to play its role. And hopefully, well, in, in general, also the industry plays along in the research phase. But this really helps, as we've seen now, to uh, to get these vaccines out early. I think one of the major achievements in this pandemic from the scientific perspective is how fast and how potent these vaccines were that were developed. And so the U.S. has been, I think, uh, um, a a beautiful example of how it should be done eh, with the BARDA initiatives, so Mm -hmm. pushing the Moderna uh, work and also pushing adenovirus work when nobody else was doing that. EU was certainly not doing it. Mm. And now again, I think the US is pushing for, what is it, 67 billion in research funds, 24, I think, for vaccines. I hope uh, the EU is going to match that. So the US is not alone this time. Mm. And that we actually will push even harder for the next pandemics to have even faster, better vaccines for any pathogen. You just said flu. Of course, Mm -hmm. for flu, we, we have some experience grown up, but the paramyxo should not be forgotten eh? with and the Nipah virus uh, out there still. um, Those are viruses to be on the lookout for as well. And so there's work to do in our laboratories. Fausto, you wanted to talk about BSL-3? Yes. 
I want to su support and also extend a little bit what Ron was saying. Uh, at least uh, in any uh, region, any uh, big uh, hospital, the BSL-3 is really useful. By the end of uh, March, we already had a neutralizing assay, neutralizing an assay to measure neutralizing activity of uh, sera of convalescent individuals has been used to attempt the, the plasma treatment initially. And now culturing all these variants, uh, we culture all the variants we collected uh, from the initial ones uh, in Bergamo, that is the Italian strain, reference strains to, to the Delta, the Gamma, whatever you want, in order to check the effect, the, the neutralizing activity of sera from um, vaccinated individuals mm -hmm. and to define if there is still an effect or not. So culturing the virus and having such facilities to test drugs or vaccines is really essential in uh, to be prepared for the next event. So Catherine, what, uh, what lessons can you give us that you've learned for the next one? Um, the importance of standards and communicating properly with the um, with the public. Um, CT value is just the bane of my life at the moment. <laughs> Everybody knows about CT value and infectivity, apparently. Um, and actually, when I mean, we used uh, 1.11 platforms across Wales, and I looked at um, CT values in relation to the first test that I that I developed, and. You know, in, in the in the low range, they are all equivalent. But as soon as you get to sort of past, you know, CT25 in my first assay, the variability is enormous, you know, and just just relying on a CT value to give you an, an idea of infectivity is just, you know, nonsense. And I think, I think, you know, trying to get that out to people, you know, has proven quite difficult. Um, and I, I absolutely concur, you know, the need, the need for um, virus um, isolation, you know, is something that in Wales we haven't done for many years. And I'm probably responsible for some of that demise. Um, but I'm planning to bring it back simply because I recognise that we do need to have the material to be able to prove that the neutralising, you know, antibody raised to vaccines and to infection um, is actually doing the job it's meant to. Um, and also to understand boosting as well, um, you know, with natural infection on top of vaccine, um, vaccine on top of natural infection. And, you know, now we're going into the third doses in the UK, you know, what it's actually going to do, whether it will neutralise the variants as they, they arise. You know, so I, I think it's, it's, but ultimately it's about communication, isn't it? And making sure we all communicate with each other so we know what everybody's doing. Because I think that, you know, the biggest lessons that I learned was learning from other countries, um, mm -hmm. In the Lombardy experience, seeing the EU experience, you know, um, the UK is very much, you know, it's it's its own island now, you know, but we can't keep our borders to ourselves. We have to look wider. Yeah, communication. I remember the old days, well, thousands of hundreds of years ago when the physician in the England said you have to wash your hands and that news took years to spread to the rest of Europe. Yeah, so it's important now and to take advantage of it. I wanted to ask um, Thea and Ron something kind of peripheral, but I'm interested. Both your countries had infections of mink, and I'm wondering what happened with that. Uh, is that finished? And Thea, what's going on? Do you know? You can say that uh, Denmark finished that history, but quite uh, okay. quite uh, radically by um, by terminating all the mink farms. And no, and no other animals have been found uh, infected, as far as you know? Um, well, yes, many animals have been found infected with that coronavirus uh, in general. But, uh, but we had 17 million minks when the, pandem wow. when the pandemic uh, started. Mm -hmm. We were number one country uh, in producing mink furs. Um, and uh, after culling of 17 million minks... Um, wow. That industry is is now dead. Yeah. So, uh, and I think that um, well, it was not my decision, and I am quite glad <laughs> I was not involved with the mint date. It's called in Denmark, but uh, but I think it was quite useful that both the Netherlands and Denmark had this close collaboration, also at a scientific level, and could compare mm -hmm. some of the findings before 
I think the Netherlands have uh, gotten better out of the mink uh, situation than Denmark. You have not had to call all your minks right run. Yeah. No, we did actually. We did. We, uh, but we were already planning to stop mink farming in the Netherlands, um, mm-hmm. and uh, that was uh, pushed forward a little bit due to the uh, outbreak. So uh, I think we were supposed to terminate mink farming this year, and we did last year because of COVID. And there really wasn't any stopping eh? when when the, the, the virus sparked into a mink farm, it just spread like wildfire. We actually did experiments on virus transmission in ferrets to show the exact same thing. You need very, very small dose, very short exposure to infect ferrets, which is a related species, of course. And, mm-hmm. and that's what we saw in the mink farms. It, it, it just spread like wildfire through these farms. There was just no stopping it. Right. But there, there are no other farmed animals that are an issue, right, in, in no. either of your countries, right? No. And we know that wild, wild animals certainly can become infected. Not much we can do about that. Here we have deer that are infected, certainly rodents, uh, and who knows how many others, right? That'll be interesting to, to learn in, in the coming years. Um, I get questions from people who say, oh, I like to hunt deer. What Should I not? <laughs> I don't know what to tell them, right? So I'd like to ask you all one last question. Uh, we we have a few minutes left here, and that is, uh, how does this end? How does this pandemic uh, end in in your view? I'm sure you've thought about it. I know it, it's hard to tell, but I'm I'm sure you have thought. So Fausto, how does this end? Well, now we see a uh, new infection only in non vaccinated individuals. So that is the major uh, point. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are people not yet vaccinated, some cannot be vaccinated, some don't want to be vaccinated. We also have anti, anti monoclonal antibodies. And that's another good news. Uh, but the main point uh, is vaccination. Okay. And uh, well, we see all the parameter now going down. So we might be moderately optimistic. It's good to be optimistic. I agree. Thea, how does this end? Well, um, I uh, I personally think that it will end like the the flu uh, subtype circulation become endemic at some point and previous coronavirus uh, circulating causing milder symptoms, most of them become mm-hmm. endemic. So I think the same thing will happen, but I think it will take another few years. I think we will continuously see uh, breakthrough infections in vaccinated we might all go through a third booster dose and have high success or maybe even have breakthrough after a while. But I think we will then learn to accept that some people will fight coronaviruses. Some people will get quite sick during the winter, but that would be no different from, uh, as we know, from influenza other than severity uh, and clinical pictures is different and worse, right? But, uh, but that's what I think. Mm, of course. Even though we're, we get used to influenza, we don't need another one. But <laughs> looks yeah. like we're looks like we're going to have one. Ron, what do you think? How does this end? Yeah, I'm with Taya. Yeah, this is not going to end. This is going mm. to stick around, and uh, these waves will dampen when people get immunized or infected. Uh, of course, it's not going to end soon for some countries in the world where vaccines are not yet applied. So we should get vaccines to them ASAP. So that also their waves will be dampened. Otherwise, um, we're going to see serious impact also on our own country. So it's in our own interest to do that. So, but this is not going to end anytime soon. There, there might be still surprises coming up. Um, we, we still understand very little about interference between different respiratory viruses, but we know from epidemiology that, uh, that, that wave of waves of one virus, uh, usually outcompete a wave by another. And so it's possible that uh, flu is going to help to yeah. to get rid of COVID uh, in our countries or RSV or um, many other viruses. So it's going to be a very interesting fall and winter 
season to see whether these viruses are going to be uh, competing with one another or interfering with one another, but also in how severe these epidemics are going to be. Yeah? People have now not seen flu for two years. Mm -hmm. And so we might see an epidemic this year twice as bad as other years. And the same is true for other respiratory viruses, we have, which we have banned from our community through social distancing and things like that. And so I, I think we're still going to see an interesting, interesting winter for virology. Um, and, but it will, it will never go away anymore. I think we will be dealing with coronavirus for a long time to come. Catherine, what do you think? Uh, I, I agree. I think, unfortunately, we're just we're going to see this now. This is going to be part of our um, our normal seasonal viruses. Um, it'll eventually settle into a pattern. Not quite sure what that pattern will look like yet. You know, whether it will settle with the coronaviruses or whether it will have its own um, seasonal transmission rate. Um, I'd like to see uh, vaccine equity better vaccine availability globally and um, try and support them, as, as Ron said. Um, I mean, you know, from, from our experience now, because we've been testing for the seasonal viruses the whole time through, we are beginning to see the seasonal viruses establish again. Um, Para-influenza 3 arrived at exactly the right time. It was a little bit of a, a higher peak than we would normally expect, but then we're testing far more people. I'd like to also think that our understanding of respiratory viruses in general, you know, uh, the, the impact that they have on our morbidity and mortality in general will be greatly appreciated and more greatly appreciated than they are now so that we can begin to perhaps tackle some of the viruses that we've had to put up with every year in the winter and have, a, you know, caused some significant pressures and, and significant illness in people in the past, you know. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's just another seasonal virus soon. You know, I, that's that's my thing, but I don't know how soon soon is. Um, and the vaccines are certainly helping. I, I just cannot believe how brilliant they are. They are. It's amazing. It's a miracle, I think. It's just wonderful. All right. That's a special episode of TWIV from ESCV. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash twiv if you want to send in questions or comments twiv at microbe.tv if you'd like to support us we'd love your support microbe.tv slash contribute i'd like to thank my four guests today for joining me fausto baldanti grazie from uh, denmark thea fisher thank you so much for coming back thea ron fouché good to see you again thank you <laughs> and Catherine Moore, thank you and nice to meet you. Yeah, and <laughs> Hey, we're great. Fausto, you have to say uh, something in Italian. Yes, prego. Prego means well, uh, you're welcome. <laughs> prego, yeah. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. And of course, thanks to the ESCV for letting us uh, do another recording here. Hope to see you next year. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>